Tonight I would like to open the Bible at the Gospel of St. Luke. I find great value, great edification, and great comfort in looking at the Gospel pictures of Jesus. How many of you like to read the Gospels and look at Jesus? And the Gospels tell us what he's like. And does the Bible not say Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever? Amen? Amen. Praise God. And this is the passage found in St. Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 35. About the blind man. I would like to look at two gospel accounts of this, really, the one in Mark and the one in Luke. And uh, notice uh, each account has a few words the other one doesn't have. There's something I like here in Luke's account that Mark doesn't have, and there are some words in the Markan account that Luke doesn't have, which have much meaning for me. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer before we begin tonight. Father, we would think that your children cannot open your word without value, without profiting. We pray that we might receive the good of the scriptures tonight. We might receive the tremendous promised grace that's in the new covenant that's expressed through Jesus Christ, your son, and released through faith in his name. Hallelujah. Lord, let us see you tonight. You said in the word, I watch over my word to perform it. So let thy Holy Spirit give us a view of thy word that man without the spirit cannot get. We pray it in Jesus' name for thy glory. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to open my Bible at both accounts, the one in Luke 18 and the one in Mark 10, 46. I shall be referring to that a little later. The Bible says in Luke 18, 35, And it came to pass that as Jesus was come near unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. The Bible tells us in Mark 10, 46, Jesus was traveling with his disciples and a great number of people. Luke calls it the multitude. Hallelujah. I have been delighting myself in recent years in the fact that's revealed in the Gospels or all through the Gospels, all through the book of Acts, through the epistles and all church history, that Jesus' movements or God's movements in the world set up tremendous currents in human society. And when Jesus moves, people move. Now, you folks are all here at Pinecrest this week simply because of the movement of Christ in the world by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. His movement has uh, somehow uh, reacted on you and put you in movement. And uh, I delight myself in the fact that in 1984, all over the world, even in Russia and China, behind the Iron Curtain, where they have tried their best to stop God, God is moving and people are moving. And this movement is an aspect of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. A social reflection of the uh, movement of God or, or what God wills in the throne. And when he wills and begins to move, people move with him. The movement of God creates social effects in the world. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, one of the words... Uh, almost my favorite word in this whole passage that has special meaning for me is that well, when Bartimaeus heard the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. Now I would suppose Bartimaeus has sat here and he's named in Mark but not in Luke. Luke universalizes and Mark personalizes. The certain blind man of Luke is named as blind Bartimaeus, the son of uh, Timaeus in Mark's Gospel. 
And uh, he had been sitting there for many years. It doesn't say he was born blind like some other men in the Bible, but we may presume he was sitting there for many years. And Bartimaeus had heard many multitudes pass by to Jerusalem. They are going toward Jerusalem. And at the high holy days, pilgrims would gather from all over the earth, coming back to the holy city. So we know that Bartimaeus had heard many multitudes pass by. And he says, he asks them, what is the meaning of this as, as the multitude passes by? This multitude passing by is a multitude with a different meaning from any crowd that has ever passed by because contained in this crowd is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, God's creative agent in creation by whom the worlds were made, by whom the ages were laid out, and he is in this multitude as it goes. Therefore, it has a different meaning than any other multitude that ever passed by. Amen. Hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. I would suppose that you could take Bartimaeus' question, what does this mean, and and keep pressing it to deeper depths and finally it would resolve itself into the question what is the meaning of life I would not be surprised that several of us maybe many of us and there's a chance that all of us today asks ourselves in our heart or the question was put to us by something what is life's meaning why am I here in fact I saw a little piece cut out of a magazine at a business I was at today for a few minutes. Why are we here? Do we have to be reduced to a Hinduistic fatalism and agree, well, like the church taught in the Middle Ages, my calling was to be a beggar. It was forever decreed that I be blind and my highest calling is to test others who go by to see if they'll give to me, to test their charitable instincts, to plumb the depths of their Christian love. The medieval church taught that beggars, the beggar is a calling, a divine calling and destiny. And in India there's fatalism that reigns and most cultures have been ruled by fatalisms. I have been fated to be this way. I sink down into it, I resign myself, and uh, I have found myself in a static existence. The Bible says he was uh, sitting by the wayside begging. We may presume he sat in the same place month after month, year after year. He had a place along the highway. That was his lot in life, to sit in the dust and to uh, be covered with the dust of the passing parade of life. and. Uh, just sit there fatalistically and wait for death while his meaning became less and less and less and worse and worse and worse. But today a crowd passes by in which is Jesus of Nazareth. He asks what it means and they say to him, Jesus of Nazareth passes by. Now Bartimaeus has heard of him before. He has heard re reports of this Strange man who was abroad on the land, who was healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, and doing uh, miracles that have not been heard of since the days of Elijah and Moses. And so something stirs in his heart. Hallelujah. The Bible says in a, in a scripture I read Monday night, hope maketh not ashamed. You know, the saddest state human existence could ever come to is when people go beyond hope and become numbed to human existence and enter into that fatalism, that determinism, whether it's a, a Calvinistic or an Augustinian determinism or it's a modern scientific mechanistic chemical determinism. I, I am this way and I can be no other way. But it's a, it, it is a tremendous thrill when hope one of the great theological virtues, one of the great elements that beats in God's own heart rises up and begins to challenge the fatalisms of life and begins to tell us things don't have to be the way they are. They can be changed. 
You know, this is what made European culture great, was that the Word of God got in it and got loose and stirred up a tremendous hope and, and, and began to speak to men of something other than a mere static existence. What does it mean? Carl Jung, the great Swiss-German psychologist, has identified the leading neurosis of modern times as the feeling that life is meaningless. And even though I am a Christian and have been born again for 31 years about, for some reason I have been able to drink the cup of modernity and taste deeply what meaninglessness feels like. And I've had to wrestle with it. And God means for me to conquer it completely, to slay it like David slew Goliath. The subject I'm touching on is one of the most tremendous of all subjects. It seals the destiny of nations and cultures and the world itself. For me to merely hope means to defy the devil and sin and all of the negatives that man knows in his broken existence. And I want to be a hoper. I want to be a man who hopes, one who hopes. And I believe God wants me to feel that my best is yet to come in life. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, in studying time and eternity and reading some books, some theology, some philosophy and thinking a lot, have come across the truth of uh, the fact that all ancient cultures lived in circular time. All ancient cultures, all Aborigines, and all cultures, including the Greek, right up to and including the Greek, they, they slightly transcended this, but they lived in a circular kind of time. It's the kind of time called by the Greek word in the New Testament, chronos, basically, the basic word for time. And uh, it's no accident that watch faces and clocks are circular because they are imitating the very kind of time they tell you. My watch tells me the kind of time in which fulfillment will never come, in which the end of the world will never come, in which eternity will never come. It, it, the eternity never comes in this kind of time. This kind of time it is an imprisoning thing. Can you imagine the tedium of Bartimaeus ticking off the minutes day after day, every second drawn out into what we call a short eternity of agony, not seeing the light, not being able to be a servant. Can you see just considering this man what a tremendous privilege it is to be a servant? Without sight you cannot be a servant, you must be served. He lived in the prison of having to have others care for him and make money for him and put it in his little cup. And the humiliation and reducing him to uh, subhuman terms. Living in that circle of existence which is established by the movement of the sun rising and passing the sky and setting and going around the earth and the return of the seasons, planning time, giving rise to the summer development which gives way to the harvest, the autumn of harvest, and the winter where the earth rests and regenerates, and then you plan again. And so all the ancient cultures are based on the circle. They were imprisoned in circular time. And do you know when this uh, human reality was first contradicted and when God Almighty broke the circle and when men began to make history? It happened when the Word of God came to a man called Abram in Ur of the Chaldees. When Abram was in Ur, out of eternity came a word that was to begin this whole process of redemption and begin to form the kingdom of God among men who were under Adam's fall, under the dark night of sin, where all men were blind like Bartimaeus. And the Word of God came to Abraham and in a radical way cracked the circle. And Abraham was the first man to cease walking in the circle of ex existence. And God says, get thee out, Abraham. 
and said a few other things, out from thy kindred, leave this place of idolatry. In fact, the very visitation of which the word was spoken, the, the, the writer of Acts says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. It was a visitation of glory, and a sharp word came and cracked the circle. Praise the Lord. And Abraham no longer walked a circle, but he began to walk the path of history, which is linear. It's a divine initiation, divine promise, divine command. And then at the end of a long pathway of human obedience, there is fulfillment, consummation. My friends, I will to believe that there is fulfillment for every beggar in this earth. That there is good news for every beggar in this earth. I got a phone call from a young man today who is a broken, shattered young man of 30 years of age. I know him. Called from the Midwest, and to, later tonight I want us all to pray for him. His name is Kevin. He's going bankrupt because he can't make a living. His wife has lost her confidence in him, so he lost his wife and family, and he went into business hoping to be able to make a lot of money and get the whole family back together and then perhaps to serve the Lord, but the Lord has allowed the business to founder and so he called me up today. He felt like he was near insanity. He's really a good-looking man. He's very big and impressive and a handsome young man, but he said he thought he was going insane today. So over the telephone, you know what I did to him? I preached good news to him. <laughs> Whenever I get the bad report, either it's going to suffocate me or I'm going to contradict it and give good news. And you see, Bartimaeus' case and Abraham's case is a proof that the gospel can penetrate anything. Really, all the battles of life boil down for us Christians. Do we or don't we believe the gospel? So the word of God cracked Abraham's circle. He began to make history. Abraham is the beginning of human history. Every other culture returns. In fact, the very basis of Hinduism is a great circle of a few billion years and uh, uh, creation gets made by one God and finally gets destroyed by another God and then out of the fragments they make it all over again and you go through endless cycles in Hinduism. There is never a final consummation in any system of thought except the very Word of God, the Bible, the Christian. The Christian revelation tells you and me we are going to be richly satisfied one day. Our cup will always run over. And the same one who broke Abraham's circle comes into the radius of Bartimaeus' experience. He hears the noise of a multitude that contains Jesus Christ who is the very word of God. He says, what does this mean? They say Jesus of Nazareth is passing by and the Bible says he cries out and he said, Jesus, thou son of David, which is equivalent to saying Messiah, a messianic title, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And that further reveals by simple analysis of the text what was the meaning in that uh, multitudinous movement. It is the movement of mercy. Jesus says, I came into the world to, to seek and to save sinners. And the seeking, saving Son of God is in that multitude. And in that multitude there is embodied the quality called mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For every one of us Christians tonight who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior in the fundamental way, no matter how failed our lives have seemed to be, no matter how barren and how little fruit they have produced, and no matter how... Uh, rotten and miserable and wretched we are in our own eyes and no matter how self-centered we have been we still embrace within our being a germ of mercy hallelujah hallelujah Jesus Christ is the king of the kingdom in fact we can say he is the kingdom and I like to say that when Simeon in the second chapter of Luke cradled the baby Jesus in his arms Simeon was holding the whole kingdom of God in his arms because he was holding the king. Hallelujah. 
Isn't that a privilege? Simeon held, cradled the kingdom of God and got such satisfaction, he, he bursts out prophetically and says, Now dismiss me, divine despot. <laughs> he says, I've lived for this moment. My meaning is fulfilled now. I overflow. Let me go right now. For God had spoken a promise. A word had come to Simeon and cracked the, the, the crust of his existence and said, you will never die until you see the Lord's salvation. Amen. Glory be to God, my friends. Praise, God. Praise the name of our God. Amen. And when he held him, he immediately said, now dismiss me. Nunc dimittis. And he called the Lord God despotes in Greek, thou benevolent dictator. You who have been determining in a benevolent way the periods of my life, let, let me go now. <laughs> Praise God. And the kingdom of God is God's great rectifying instrument to set everything right. And as we preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, the very message Jesus preached, and as we seek to rediscover that primitive gospel and all of its uh, virgin dynamic, we realize that Jesus has come into the radius of Bartimaeus' experience to rectify his human existence. For after all, uh, Bartimaeus is a son of the covenant and as such he has rights. Do you know, my friends, the gospel promises rights to humanity. There are human rights promised and validated in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, this New Testament. And I believe that the gospel even alleviates at least one kind of poverty. I'm talking about simple financial poverty and there are several types of poverty there's a voluntary religious poverty in which C.S. Lewis lived giving away third or half or three quarters of his wages as a great professor because he willed to live in Christian poverty he knew a thing or two but there's a poverty called binding poverty and the gospel delivers us from that and I don't care if you live in India or Africa even the Mningi's pygmy tribe, when they came under the Holy Spirit of God through John Graham Lake, his tribe was forever delivered from uh, want and sickness and starvation because the kingdom began to be active in, in that little pygmy tribe. And no more were they preyed upon by neighboring tribes. And he told Dr. Lake, no longer have we gone hungry since with the big one, the big white bona paid prayed for us. Hallelujah. Even the pygmy whom the Watusi say don't even have souls could get blessed by the administration of John Graham Lake in the jungles of Africa. Praise the Lord, my friends. I want to stir your hearts to hope. And I want to contradict the uh, 20 or 30 years of preaching against hope we've had. And I myself did that some years ago, influenced by perhaps Brother Kenyon and others. We used to preach a sermon called The Failure of the Hoper. And the upshot was the hoper doesn't get what he wants, but the man of faith gets it. Well, I want to tell you there's something lovely about hope. It penetrates the future. Amen. Hope penetrates God's future. And the Bible says, hope maketh not ashamed. And as they pass by, uh, Bartimaeus says, hope is stirred, and he cries out. Hallelujah. He cries out. He cries to the right one. You know, I, as I read this today, I felt some feelings and thought some thoughts I never thought before. That Jesus of Nazareth, and I guess I should read a little bit more here. Yeah, he cried, verse 38, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they who went ahead rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. Society versus the needy individual. Is it not amazing that this religious group of disciples of whom there are 12 special ones and 70 who are called disciples and then many more who know him in varying degrees, these very people command this needy man to keep quiet. 
The social reality seeks to stifle the anguished cry of the individual. That has powerful implications in it for me. Because I have to decide whether I'm going to stand with the multitude against the troublesome individual who would upset our plans or perhaps arrest our tremendous uh, dynamic forward motion we're in. We're going places in the crowd with Jesus and you keep quiet, you, may, you might ha make us have to put the brakes on and we'll have to generate this dynamic energy all over again. You know, when I drive my car, I try never to come to a total stop. If I see a red light way up ahead, I drive like a truck driver because I know that more fuel is taken getting a car moving. And if you can keep any motion going, it's, it costs you a lot less to get going again. And here is some... some uh, a needy individual at the edge of the crowd crying and wanting to stop this procession. And the question is, do we have time for the needy individual? Or do we also become clever religionists, icy, feelingless Pharisees who would rather the needy one kept his mouth shut and stuck to his fatalistic destiny. After all, we'll soon be by him and we won't have the vision of the beggar in our eyes anymore. We'll pass him by and leave him and we'll forget him in a few days. Remember when Jesus fed to 5,000, his disciples said, send them away. He said, no, you feed them. And his demand was unreasonable because there was nothing to work with. They want to send them away empty, fainting. Jesus says, give ye them to eat. And then he says, what do we have? And there was only a little bit. And Jesus took that little into his creative hands. The secret is in Matthew 14. Uh, uh, give them to me, he says. The five loaves, and he says, give them to me. The secret is in getting your little bit into the hands of Jesus. Give them to me. Into his creative hands go our miserable five loaves. In fact, it was a little boy who carried them there. Praise God. When you've served Jesus, you can travel light. Somebody else carries the basic raw material and Jesus has the creative power and you go carry. Jesus said when you go forth, don't take uh, a bag, don't take a staff, don't take an extra coat, don't take two pair of shoes. When you go in the gospel call, take nothing. What does he mean by that? The creative Christ will cause everything to spring out of the ground over there that you're called to. And you'll find that the ground you're called onto will produce everything you need in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. In fact, he said, if you forsake everything to follow me, you'll receive a hundredfold more in this life. Houses, fathers, mothers, lands, etc. I guess I'm preaching for the way of faith tonight. Preaching for me. I need more faith. <laughs> Preach to myself and use you as an excuse. And if you get something, that's, that's your business. Praise the Lord. Isn't this biblical Christianity challenging and tremendous? Jesus comes into Bartimaeus' life to be a restorer. The original destiny of man is spoken clearly in the Bible. Let me uh, look at that original destiny of man. I'll open the Bible to Genesis. Some people I know refer to this quite often. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God's original destiny for man was one of dominion over sea and land. And Markham's poem, The Man with the Hoe, has a dramatic expression as he looked at that painting by the Frenchman Millet, 
and saw the brutalized French agricultural toiler there with his hoe, he says, is this the thing the Lord God made, formed and made to have dominion over land and sea? And he asks in his poem, whose hand slanted back this brow? Where did this brutalizing process originate? And in his poem, you can feel the prophetic uh, uh, might of God uh, venting its wrath and desiring to restore man back to its original form in God. And how many know the gospel is working in all the earth tonight to restore man to his original destiny and calling and order in God? Hallelujah. That we are to have dominion over demons and disease and death and poverty. Praise God. In a general sense, I'm saying that. And how many testimonies I've heard from uh, people in the Pentecostal movement that had faith. I remember Bill Velmer Gardner, who was one of Oral Roberts' good friends, testifying years ago, and he was the chief fundraiser for ORU, getting up to as high as a million dollars in one offering. And uh, one time years ago before, when Velmer was still in his own evangelistic healing ministry, a farmer from the Dakotas approached him one night at his tent meeting, I think it was, and said, Brother Gardner, the wheat crop this year is the greatest it ever was in history, but there's a plague of grasshoppers, which the Bible calls locusts, devouring everything in their pathway. So Velmer Gardner said, can you believe God? And the man said, yes. And they clasped their hands and Brother Gardner prayed a short prayer of faith. And the farmer went home and sometime later he encountered Brother Gardner again. He said, Brother Gardner, the grasshopper plague came to my farm and at the fence row they died and drifted 18 inches deep all along the line of my wheat ranch. And he said, I have the greatest crop in my entire life. And all of my friends and neighbors have been wiped out this year. They lost everything. But he said the grasshoppers came to the fence row and died and piled that deep all along his property line. And his wheat was spared by exercising this Bible teaching on the dominion God gave to man. Amen. Jaime Rubenstein, the converted Jew who was a gangster, Heard about the, the uh, lice devouring the barley for the Dutch farmers in South Africa. And he went down to, uh, I guess, Dutch Reformed headquarters. And <laughs> they had an argument over the power of God. And Jaime got indignant and says, what's the matter? Don't you people believe God? And so he went out to these Dutch farmers and, and, and his new, being a Jewish convert full of zeal and a, Jew, a Christian Jew is rather special in a way. He rebuked the lice. And God honored his prayer in regard to the barley of the Dutch farmers in South Africa. This was in the 50s. Both of these happened. So there is dominion in God's word, in Christ's name, in the Holy Ghost. How many believe that? Amen. There is a dominion, whether we're faulty at exercising it. And I could give you story after story in the Pentecostal movement. I know Brother Hoyer knows many. Young lady in the Canadian Pentecostal outpouring, 196 or 7, rebuked a prairie fire in the name of the Lord. Uh, as she prayed, a voice said, command the fire to be quenched. And she walked out. She was about 20 years old, a young married girl, and commanded the fire to be quenched. And the prairie fire was conquered in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Testimony after testimony, Mr. Ball that makes jars at a factory in San Francisco in the time of the great earthquake and fire. He was a... Fundamentalist believer and tithed on his income. Guess what happened during the San Francisco fire and earthquake to Mr. Ball's jar factory? Not one jar was lost. Neither cracked nor melted. How does that come about? How can a whole city get flattened and Mr. Ball's jar factory get no damage in the earthquake? <laughs> and many other testimonies, which may sound incredible. I know they sound that way. Do you see a miracle? <laughs> you're there, it's, it's something strange to you. Praise the name of the Lord. <clears throat> the point of challenge for me is, can I stand against the multitude who tells him to keep quiet? And can I stand on the side of Christ 
who is sensitive to need. Can you imagine the uproar and a great multitude going along at the ear of Jesus Christ? Here's a cry from somewhere out on the periphery. Through the confusion and the dust comes a cry for all. Jesus Christ is supremely sensitive to need. He's sensitive to your need. And as the songwriter said, he'll hear your heart's faintest cry. Do you love him tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, <clears throat> there's something in the story that fascinates me. Now, let me see. I want to look at both accounts here. The Bible says in, in Luke, Jesus stood. And Mark says, Jesus stood still. Mark says, Jesus stood still. Walter Kronberg used to preach a, one of those dynamic, evangelistic, fiery sermons called The Man Who Arrested God. The man being Bartimaeus and God being embodied in Jesus Christ. His despairing, hungering cry caused Jesus to stand still. About a year ago, I became fascinated with the, with the evident fact in the Bible story that as Jesus passes by Bartimaeus and uh, finally they make voice contact, voice and ear contact, when Jesus hears his voice and decides uh, to minister to this man, uh, Jesus Christ does not walk over to Bartimaeus, seek him out and walk over to him and stretch his hand out so he can and touch him. But Jesus stands still, leaving a space between himself and Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus has to use his meager human powers to get to his feet and uh, stumble his way over to Jesus. Wouldn't Jesus have been more merciful had he said, now just sit still, sit still, I'll come over. Don't trouble you, don't risk falling down. I'll come over, you just wait a minute till we make a path through the crowd here. No, Jesus stands still and he says, tell them, uh, go tell him to come over to me. The Bible says Jesus commanded him to be called in Mark 10.49. He commanded him to be called. Something is demanded of Bartimaeus. What does this space represent and this call represent? It represents the divine demand for faith on your part. Even God Almighty cannot will for a man and a woman and he cannot believe for you. Bartimaeus has to uh, use his feeble remnants of human force to get to Jesus and demonstrate he has faith to be healed. Hallelujah. Human reasoning would say Jesus would have been more merciful to cover that distance and meet the blind man right on his ground. But I like to teach that Jesus Christ gets men and women on their feet. When you have fallen into the static, fatalistic existence and uh, I have been tasting and feeling and realizing how terrible it is in recent years. I have been down in New York City a number of times. In fact, the last time I was there I preached on Blind Bartimaeus one of the nights. I had great liberty on the skid row to preach the Word of God. I have been realizing how terrible is the state of modern human existence. And Jesus Christ comes and gets us on our feet. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ will get us on our feet. His commandment will raise us up. Even before we have our sight. Even before the work is complete. We get on our feet. We, we renounce the static state of existence. We affirm the dynamic destiny of God. Hallelujah. Can you say praise the Lord tonight, saints? They call the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. Be of good comfort represents the word of the gospel. 
We receive good comfort when we first get the good news. Hallelujah. I like to magnify the power of the Word of God. And I like to meditate and think about the limitless power and authority God pours into the simple word of the gospel. When Thomas Wyatt, the great uh, deliverance preacher, the great latter rain prophetic preacher, went to Nigeria in 1953, he was preaching at uh, a, a big old church. It was kind of like a ruin and I suppose 30,000 people or so gathered around in front of us, so they preached to the outdoors, not to the group inside. And they had a platform built, and there was a railing around it. And Dr. Wyatt was watching as he preached the gospel of the kingdom, and there was a great black leper lying down at the weight of about 200 pounds. Dr. Wyatt saw him. They'd brought him on a kind of a pallet or stretcher and laid him down. So as Dr. Wyatt preached, the good news of the gospel of the kingdom, he watched the man's expression in his eyes and he said, I saw a look of raging hunger like I have never seen before. So Dr. Wyatt, instead of uh, interrupting God's process, he just, just allowed the man to be under the operations of the Holy Spirit. And Dr. Wyatt saw as that great leper whose legs I believe were useless began to claw with his arms. And he clawed his way over to the uh, bottom of the platform and then he lifted himself up and he was holding under the railing and uh, Doc Wyatt said I never saw such a look of raging hunger in human eyes before as that great leopard desired to be cleansed of his leprosy and as Dr. Wyatt saw his desire building suddenly said to some of the ministers tear the railing down and they tore the railing down and the man struggled still further using his last ounces of effort and suddenly Doc Wyatt reached his hand down and grasped the leper and saw God's power flow in and cleanse him of leprosy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Even a leper clawing his way out of the circle, uh, the prison house of existence as the word of God begins to penetrate the crevices of the human predicament. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of our God. I hope some of you get on fire with a vision that goes beyond your cornfields and your offices, as Philet used to say. That we forget about ourselves. You know, we want to focus God's whole kingdom on our little selves. But the, the secret is looking away from self to others and beginning to give the five loaves and two fishes you have. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. How many of you believe in the ultimate triumph of the gospel? Even the Puritans preached and believed that. That the, the lines of force in human history are being determined by the kingdom and this man, Jesus Christ, who is the king. I have an excellent book by a Dutch Reformed theologian called Jesus Christ, The Meaning of History. Jesus Christ's gospel, his kingdom, his, his church are the history-making force in the world. And we have got to uh, take upon ourselves the garment of divine responsibility and take this task up with, with full consciousness and do it with all our might. Praise the Lord. Yes, the word of the gospel. Be of good comfort, he calleth thee. What is the gospel but the call from the very mouth of Jesus Christ? Let me read a couple Matthew and passages from the first gospel. My favorite passage, I think, or just about Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus almost reducing the whole gospel to this powerfully dramatic word. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. What, a blind man, a laborer? Yes, laboring under the burden of broken existence laboring under a partial, partially fulfilled destiny, laboring under being deformed in regard to God's original form and plan for man. And Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Blindness is a heavy burden, and Jesus takes it away. Hallelujah. Now I want to look at another gospel picture of the word of the gospel. And this is <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 14, where Jesus goes to his disciples across the stormy waters of Gennesaret. And uh, when they see him, they think it's a ghost, and Jesus announces himself, says, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Again, out of his mouth is coming the word of the gospel. Do you get the concept? Do you grasp the mystique? The word of the gospel, his word of grace, good news. And God in English, God is named from the very word good. God and good are absolute uh, etymological identities. The early missionaries in England uh, said to the Anglo-Saxon people when they said, what's his name? They said his name is good. God actually is an archaic form of good. And in the old Anglo-Saxon gospel, you'll find they're spelled the same way even. And Jesus says, it is I be of good cheer. And Peter said, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, and when he said come, he compressed the entire power of the gospel into one word, come. And come, the word of the gospel proves to be a word that can bridge an impossibility. And through an impossibility, Peter made his way to Jesus. Hallelujah. When Jesus throws out the gospel bridge to you, I tell you, you can get to Jesus. Though it's socially painful, though it's... Uh, physically painful and difficult when the word come is thrown to you across whatever your difficulties are you can get to Jesus when the young man talked to me on the phone today I had to either confirm him in human despair or I had to contradict human despair and affirm to him that he can get to Jesus he said brother I can't get any feelings at all anymore I said you're going to have to go on will alone what could I tell him? I contradicted every impossibility and left him with a bridge to Jesus. And at the end of the conversation, he declared he felt much different and promised me he would take Mark's gospel and begin to read it over and over and over. And he would seek out a fellowship or a prayer meeting or something and begin to fellowship and that he would begin to receive love, which he needs. 30-year-old and rebellious and has cracked his life up. We're going to pray for him tonight a little later. Let me look back to the account. Jesus stood still, commanded him to be called, gave him the word of comfort, the gospel word, Verse number 50 in Mark. This is one of the words in Mark. I like the word in Luke. Uh, what does it mean, he says. I like the word in Mark. He, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. I like the word in Mark. Casting away his garment. Let's just interpret this a little bit and define it for you. Well, how can we define it? I think I heard Brother Moore preach on this, and I don't know if he defined it. He, he dwelled on this verse some. I don't remember what he said now. But may I suggest, first of all, a simple interpretation. Bartimaeus has been a beggar, and this afternoon he has changed to a prayer. <clears throat> Excuse me. He has gone from begging to praying. You know what I think about offering, taking, and fundraising efforts? This is, this is my doctrine about raising money in churches and for para-church structures. This is my doctrine. When you ask man, you're begging, and when you ask God, you're praying. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I like C.T. Studd's Worldwide Evangelization Crusade because those ministers have yet to ask for their first offering. 
the many men in WEC, which headquartered north of Philadelphia, have yet to ask for their first offering in history. A principle laid down by C.T. Studd, who was a wealthy, privileged Englishman and the cricket champion of England, he said, we will never ask man for money. God will finance his work. And when Pauline, uh, his daughter, and Norman Grubb visited C.T. Studd in Africa in his last years, he said to Pauline, his daughter, in their last meeting together, he said, I would give you something, but I gave away all that I have years ago. All he could give Pauline was faith, a heritage of faith. C.T. Studd was dying, and his response to dying was to go to Africa on his sixth or seventh faith charge and the dying man went to Africa and lived 18 more years and did wonders for God's kingdom. He, had, he went on what they called a faith charge. He did that six or seven times in life. And every time he conquered those terrifying giants of human existence that people the landscape and keep us out of our promised land. I like that. He went as a dying man and lived 18 more years. Oh, we of this present hour need to grasp that raw, primitive, smashing dynamic of faith. You'll never be your best person. You'll never be your best self unless you're a believing you. He casting away his garment. His garment was a badge of beggary. It was, his, it was the social distinction he wore. He needs it no longer. He throws it away. But there's a more profound reason which in which I may be spiritualizing and using what we call ministerial license. But I want to consider it and look at it anyway. Well, before I turn to that, let's look at Philippians 4, 6. I want to just discuss how begging and praying differ. The difference in begging and prayer. Philippians 4, 6. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. We know the beggar lived in daily anxiety. Amen. The fear that is more basic than fear itself is what they call existential anxiety. It's the dread of nothing in particular and it drives you mad. But Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Thank you, Lord. Begging has no thankful element in it. Prayer is only prayer when it is with thanksgiving. The best way to start any prayer is by thanking God. Amen. What do you think? I thank you for the gift of existence. Hallelujah. I thank you for the gift of this personality. I thank you for this uh, somatic instrument I have to be in the world and to move. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In this story, Jesus is going to bring Bartimaeus into movement. The kingdom of God is movement toward the divine consummation. I cannot be grateful enough that God called me out of my little narrow side hill uh, Anglo-Saxon existence into the broader horizons of his kingdom and I'm moving with him. I have met hundreds and hundreds of people I never would have met. I've seen the works of God, miracles on occasion, mere short prayer, killing cancer, deaf ears of my personal friends open, seeing cataracts come right down off people's eyes onto their cheeks before my eyes. Praise God. Amen. Prayer difference from begging in that it's thankful. I just want to remind you, before Jesus broke loaves and fishes and put creative power into play, he gave thanks to his Father in heaven so that I teach that uh, thanksgiving is the attitude of creativeness. Creativeness carries a characteristic attitude which is thanksgiving. Also, begging is a joyless thing. In fact, it, it humiliates you. It drives you deeper into the ground. But Jesus is asking, you shall receive that your joy may be full. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
And now, another reason why he casts away his garment, why it's uh, the right thing, a good thing, a beneficial thing to do. Let me open the Bible to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 20. <clears throat> He cast aside, he cast away his garment. Ephesians 4.20 But ye have not so learned Christ, so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former manner of life the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Christianity at its very heart and core is a putting off and a putting on in the high Pauline theology. Praise God. Your old garments are saturated with the flavor of the old life. How many have ever taken a bath and due to circumstances you had to put on the same clothes you wore before the bath? And so things were not quite satisfactory. In fact, probably in our case, since we're so much cleaner than they could have been back there, probably our difficulties were more psychological than physical. We were hurt psychologically, we had to wear, put the same clothes on again. But ideally, when you bathe, you put on a clean set of garments that have been washed thoroughly. Amen? Amen. And so Bartimaeus casts aside his garment. Praise the Lord. May God give us the grace to put off and put on as Paul teaches. You can meditate on that. Amen. Now, Jesus says... Jesus says to uh, Bartimaeus when he was come near, I'm in Luke 18, 40. Jesus said, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? The sovereign Lord of the universe makes his will subject to a beggar's will. I want to show you a contrast and a rather startling fact in the Bible. One will be found in Mark chapter 10 preceding this story. This is uh, Mark 10:35. And a request is made by Jesus' good friends and cousins, I believe, James and John. Yaakov and Yochanan bar Zabdai, sons of Zebedee. They came to him in Mark 10, 35, saying, Master, we would or we will that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire or will. We want you to make your will for a moment subject to our wills, that we might get what we want. Jesus said unto them, What will ye that I should do for you? <laughs> they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. And Jesus said, No. The Gospels reveal Jesus being hard on religious people and gentle and forbearing with sinners and needy people. He had his sharpest, almost unbearable conflicts with Pharisees, scribes, and lawyers, and high priests. And so two of his very best friends, I believe John was his very best friend, his special disciple, the disciple he loved, he's called in the Bible. He asks for a, a special request, and Jesus says, no. He, John says, make your will subject to mine just for a moment so I can get a certain special thing I want. Tell me what it is, Jesus says. He says, no. He refuses him. Bartimaeus comes up and Jesus says, he says to, uh, uh, Jesus says to Bartimaeus, what wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? Jesus saying, for one request for one moment, I will make my will, I put my will at your disposal. What do you want, blind man? And he says, Lord, that I may receive my sight. <laughs> Jesus says, yes. 
I like that set of contrasts. We learn by contrasts. Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. He has entered upon a dynamic way. Jesus said, I am the way. He will never sit and beg again. In fact, blind Bartimaeus became a member of the First Jerusalem Church and was probably well known to the gospel writers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was prepared by this meeting for full entrance into the New Testament church. Praise God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Hallelujah. Can we give praise unto God tonight? Now, what I'd like for us to do, uh, could we possibly come forward tonight? We'll have a a little bit something reminiscent of the 19th century altar calls. We'll come forward. If any of you want prayer, we'll pray for you. Just come right up here. Just rise. Those of you who want to, if you don't care to do that, you don't need to. But come up. I want us all to pray for.